before I start, I would just like to um, acknowledge the traditional owners of the land on which we're all gathering and meeting today. Um, for me, that is in the home of the Awabakal people. I'm in Lake Macquarie today, and I would like to pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging. And I know that you'll join me in the same wherever you are today in this beautiful country. Um, I would just first of all like to introduce myself. So my name is Maria Crilly, and I am currently in the Systems Improvement Directorate at the Clinical Excellence Commission. Really delighted to be able to present to you today. Before I start, I'd just like to tell you a little bit about the human side of me and tell you a little bit about me. I am a nurse and a midwife by background, and I started my training way back um, in 1984 as an orthopaedic student nurse. So if you're adding up, you'll know that I'm pretty much um, getting on there now. So midwifery is my background and nursing, and you'll see that is a picture of me on the left-hand side of the screen. The other little people are the grandchildren in my life. So we actually have six grandchildren um, between us and you'll see my husband and just because um, they're not enough to keep us busy um, we have nine children between us as well we've got two dogs um, and the other picture that I'd really like to share with you is up on the top right hand side of the screen um, and this is really important this was a photo that I had taken when I visited the UK um, more or less two years ago now actually and I went to do human factors in healthcare training with a company called Global Air Training. And I'd really like to acknowledge the learning that they shared with me in that week. And the two instructors, particularly um, two Daves on either end of the photos that you're looking at. And you'll see that they absolutely love um, the role that they do. And I'm really um, appreciate the learning that they shared and hope to be able to share some of that with you today as we move through our webinar. So just some guidance for our session. Um, it is meant to be interactive. We'd really love if you could join in and um, just to have a practice, if you can open your comments box on the right hand side, if you've not done that already. So just click on the little icon and just send us a hello message. Um, Zeb, um, who you heard me talk to at the beginning, he's online and throughout the session, he'll be keeping an eye on the chat box. There'll be things going up in there, links to resources that may be useful for you, and you'll be able to go back to them at the end. Um, but very importantly, if you've got anything that you want to say, you want to ask, please put it in there, because what we're going to ask you to do is to keep on mute um, throughout, just so that everybody will get the best experience from the webinar. So use the comments box, give us your feedback. There'll be things that we're asking you about. So. Um, if you can just remember to keep on mute um, when you're not speaking and then don't forget to unmute when you do want to speak, really important. So if there, is, you know, there will be opportunities. If you put in the chat, we will invite you to speak if there's something that you want to join in on and, and Zeb will um, let me know about that. Um, the webinar will be recorded and it will be available via the CEC website and also our YouTube channel. Um, we would hope that they will be up by the end of this week, and if not, they will be certainly up there early next week so that you'll be able to share um, these and the other webinars that I'll tell you about at the end of the session um, with your colleagues. So for the webinar today, what's the theme that I really want to focus on, the theme for the World Patient Safety Day this year um, in 2020 is around health worker safety. This year, 2020, the theme that we're really focusing on is around health worker safety. And it's really thinking about the interrelationship between health worker safety and patient safety. So based on the fact that we've got safe health workers, we've got safe patients. And how important it is that we can all speak up for that health worker safety. This also gives us a really strong platform for positive changes towards that healthier, safer, and happier health workforce. And human factors really comes into that. It comes into its own. If, we're, if we are to improve the safety of our healthcare workers, then we have to look at the human aspects um, of um, being, being human and how that affects us and looking at those human factors. 
So what we're going to do is we're going to define human factors. We're going to consider why they're so important in healthcare. And then if you've not met them already, we're going to actually meet the dirty dozen. And then very importantly, we're going to explore how using the dirty dozen can actually assist you and also your colleagues um, in your workplace. So if we think about what is human factors and ask that question. So International Ergonomics Association, they will define it as being the scientific discipline that's concerned with the understanding of interactions among humans and other elements of a system. Basically, it's the science of people at work. And the World Health Organization describe it really nicely, particularly like their definition. They describe it as being the study of all the factors that make it easier to do work in the right way. So they're the things that we need to really consider. To think about that and put it in all in perspective, we must remember that you know humans are the greatest source of strength in healthcare. But as humans, we have to remember that we're all we're all human and none of us are infallible. So every day as we get up and we face a new day, it doesn't matter how hard we try and think that, you know, the human aspects stay with us. But that is so important. That's what, you know, that's the key part of what makes us um, our being. But we've just got to understand it a little bit more and just explore that um, a bit deeper to just think about it. But none of us, it doesn't matter what position we hold. It doesn't matter if we're the most junior person in an organization, if we're the least experienced or if we're the chief executive of an organization, we are all capable of making mistakes. And I'm sure that everyone who's online today can think of at least one mistake, however minor that may be, but that they've made today. And, they, and you will have made that without any intent. If you didn't, you've probably just not thought about it. And um, if we really think about it, we, this happens to us all the time. Um, the thing about that's really important as well to remember is that just because we come into the workplace, we can't stop being human. We don't want to stop being human, but it's taking that understanding with us. And whilst we're very aware in our home place that we make mistakes, I certainly know I'm told many times at home that I make mistakes, forget things, make errors. When we come to work, it has a different significance. And so we're obviously putting that, you know, much more effort in. It's much more important, but we still can't, you know, avoid that fact. What we need to do is explore it, understand it, and then put some strategies in place. So just a few little exercises and tricks. So in the chat box, I'm going to see um, if anybody can be the first person to tell me who made this statement and I'm going to read it out in case anybody's just listening and this person said I never saw a wreck and never have been wrecked nor was I ever in any predicament that threatened to end in disaster of any sort if anybody Zeb if anybody gets the answer if you can shout up and let me know we've got a, f a first answer we've got a and first answer Correcto. and it's correct okay so for those of you that thinking, it's this guy. And he was actually Edward John Smith, who was the captain of the RMS Titanic. And he made this statement on live radio um, only a few days before the ship, the ship set sail. And if you think, you know, Edward John Smith was a very experienced um, person in his role. He was, you know, highly trained and, you know, really well set up for this occasion. But it, this is just a warning to us all that we can become complacent, however experienced we are in what we're doing. Sorry, if I could just ask um, everyone to go on mute, please. Hello. If we could just ask everyone to go on mute, just so that everyone else can hear the webinar, please. Thank you. That's amazing. So. Moving on from our Captain Smith, I'm just going to get you to do a little exercise. I want you to look at this on the screen and read it out loud to yourself. And when you read it out, most people will read it out and they'll read out a bird in the hand. I'm just going to show you some other versions of this. Um, you remember as well, you're on a session, you're doing human factors. You know that I'm going to try and obviously show you some ways of how the brain works. But when you look 
um, at this, most people, when they look at that first triangle, when they first look at that image, they will read it as a bird in the hand. When you actually look again, you'll see that it says a bird in the, the hand, and there's two there's. That's because that's using our system one part of our brain that instantly recognizes patterns and will tell us um, what that works. You're probably trying to add in your system to your more analytical thinking because you know that I'm showing you things that you're looking for what I'm trying to trick you with. So you may have seen it. If you look on the screen to the right, you'll see on the top line, you're probably much more likely to notice that error just because of the way you have to read across and you're likely to see the the. But if you look below, again, you're probably likely to miss the second the in that. Most people will do that. Imagine if you're not even, you're just in the middle of a busy day, you're in the middle of something else and you're looking at that. How easy would it be to, you know, to spot that? So this is one for the polling um, that I want you to tell me which is the longest line. And I want you to tell me if it's A or is it B? So when you're looking at that, what does your brain instantly tell you? So hopefully we're getting some responses on there. But most people, if they look at this, their instant recognition, they will respond and immediately think that B is the longest line, when in fact they're actually equal. That's just how our human um, brain will work and will process things. That's, you know, part of that seeing how we see things and our perception of things. I'm going to read this out to you. So this came from the University of Cambridge, and I'll read it out and see um, how fast this goes. So according to a research at Cambridge University, it doesn't matter in what order the letters in a word are. The only important thing is that the first and last letter be at the right place. The rest can be a total mess and you can still read it without problem. This is because the human mind does not read every letter by itself, but the word as a whole. So I have not learned this off by heart. I don't have a good memory to remember things like that. I've just read those letters, but very quickly, your brain can unravel things and recognizing the patterns that it's looking for. We have to be aware of that because that can be a good thing. Otherwise, I wouldn't have been able to read this paragraph to you. But remember as well that it's not, you know, that does make us aware of how we interpret and tell ourselves what we, you know, it's will interpret it as what we think we see rather than what we're actually seeing. So most people online, if you put, you know, I'm sure that you're reading it as fast as um, I could. I'm going to tell you a little story now. OK, and this is the story of how I actually got to work one day and had to manage without any lunch. So it's 1.16 now. So if any of you have not had lunch, you'll feel my pain. You'll know how unpleasant this day was going to be for me. So arrived at work this day and went to the fridge to get my lunch and it wasn't there. I'm going to take you back a few steps because on this day, I actually prepared for myself the most beautiful wrap. And if you look on the screen, um, it may not have been that exact wrap, but I can tell you it was just as delicious and it was prepared. It had got all my favorite things in. So got on the case, looked at the clock. The clock's ticking. I've got to start moving. I'm in a rush. I need to get moving. I've got to get into work. So need to wrap up the wrap. So go to get some glad wrap, wrap it up. <gasps> There's no glad wrap left. I've run out. Just don't have any in the cupboard. Doesn't matter. I've got some lovely gray carrier bags. So um, you will remember not so long ago that Coles and Woolies um, would supply these and we'd have many of them. If any of you are anything like me, you may have well saved these in your cupboard. Um, and on this day, they literally saved me. I was able to just wrap my wrap in a lovely clean carrier bag and take it to work. Time was running out, I was getting late. I needed to grab my bag, grab my keys, make sure I've got my phone. Um, I've got to make sure the dogs are locked out the back, lock the door and throw the rubbish in the bin on the way out to work. OK, so get to work. Lunchtime, go to the fridge to get my wrap um, in the chat. Please tell me, where is my wrap? Zeb, tell me where where does everybody think my wrap is? Because I didn't know it took me a few minutes on this day to work out where in the fridge my wrap was. I think it might be in the bin. 
might be in the bin. It absolutely was in the bin. Do you think I meant to put it in the bin? I definitely not did not mean to put it into the bin. I definitely did not intend to make that error. Um, but why did I put it in the bin? Put it in the bin because grey carriers are usually what I put rubbish in. They're usually what I would have put rubbish and put it in the bin. So my brain played a trick on me that day. And while I was rushing, I just put it into the bin. So it was gone. There was no going back. One good thing, because you always have to put strategies in place. I rang Coles and Woolies up and told them this story. And they did feel really sorry for me not having a wrap. And so they they decided that they would just remove these grey bags from the shelves. Um, and so you can't get them anymore. And that's the reason why. So um, just to share that with you. So you might be thinking, OK, so all of this, how can understanding human factors help at work then? So it actually can. If we start to think and understand human factors principles, it can really enhance patient safety and clinical quality, as well as supporting our healthcare personnel and optimizing well-being while at work. So really important factors when we're thinking about our health workers safety um, in, you know, for World Patient Safety Day. So it helps us to, if we understand and apply a human factors approach in healthcare settings, it's going to really enhance the way that healthcare is delivered and received. We know that if we understand it more, therefore it's going to enhance safety, it's going to reduce errors, it's going to enhance personal well-being and it enables us, us to perform more efficiently. So many reasons why it's really important the thing we're going to really concentrate on today in that aspect is what leads to human errors. And we're just going to explore that a little bit more. And when we talk about an error, what we mean is it's a consequence of a human involvement that causes a deviation from an individual's or organizational intentions or expectations. So the error that I made that day, um, putting the rubbish in the bag, was a consequence of my involvement there. And it certainly was not my intention. If we're going to take a human factors approach to think about that, we need to understand how and why a threat or error occurred in the first place. And then if we do that, then we, we can also then think about how they can be identified, reduced or managed. If you're thinking, OK, what's the difference between a threat and error? If we think about that um, in terms of um, maybe, for example, a patient that's allergic to penicillin, that's a threat to them. They have that allergy. An error is going to be if we actually administer them with that penicillin. So they're the differences when they actually happen. What we want to do is to start to think more about what the threats are and what the potentials are so that we can either reduce them or we can manage them to put things in place. So if we do that, that will improve our situational awareness. That will improve our awareness of everything that's happening. So to reiterate, then, if we if we can notice it and understand it, then we can plan ahead and put these strategies. And that takes our situational awareness from being in the red, where we're not too aware. We want to get into the green. We're probably, in terms of threats and errors, always in that amber. It's a, a good, healthy space to stay always alert for potential for risk or error, but we certainly want to get out of any red phases. So finally, you get to meet the Dirty Dozen. Um, and the Dirty Dozen on screen may not be quite who or what you were expecting to see when you came on this webinar, but I can tell you that these Dirty Dozen um, that we're looking at right now probably did contribute to a lot of things um, not going so well. But the Dirty Dozen that we're going to look at today is actually a concept that was developed by Gordon Dupont. Now, Gordon Dupont was a guy who was working in 1993 for Transport Canada. And he started looking and studying um, the accidents or incidents in his work area. And what he came up with were elements that can act as precursors to these accidents or incidents and things that influence people to make mistakes. So this is what we're going to explore a bit more today. Now, the Dirty Dozen doesn't give us a comprehensive list of human error, but it does give us something that we can work with. And it's worked really well in aviation industries and certainly in the maintenance industry that um, Gordon Dupont was in. 
So we're going to look and we're going to think and identify risks or hotspots using these. And then we're going to come up with some strategies. So these are our data dozen for today. So 12 things. I'm sure all of them are things that you're totally um, familiar with, that you've come across. Um, and these are the data dozen that back in 1993 he came up with. We're going to explore them um, a bit deeper today and we're going to get you thinking because what's most important is that you think about how the data dozen would translate into your working day, into your working environment and the working environment of your team. Another little story before we go on, um, just to get you thinking about how um, we can be prone to error and we're going to come back to this story at the end because I'm going to get you to think about what Dirty does and we're involved. But I want you to think about how easy or difficult it can be to make a correct selection when you go into um, a supermarket. So if you go into Coles, Woolies, um, wherever, I, to buy your um, tomato sauce, you will see a display, something like that one that's on the right. And you can see that they all look very similar. Now, the sauce bottles on the left are actually, they all came off that shelf. You can see when they're side by side, they're a bit easier to differentiate. But on the right, it can be really difficult and it can be really easy to take the wrong source bottle home. Now, you may think, OK, that's not really such a bad thing. For me, um, these days now, all my kids are growing up. If I bring the wrong source bottle home, it doesn't really matter too much. Um, I'll just buy another bottle the next time. Um, when my daughter was 12, I can tell you it was a major thing. Um, if I brought home the wrong sauce, particularly if I probably brought one of those that had got the no added sugar and things, that would have been a that would have been a huge problem, and my error would have been um, talked about for some time. Um, I want you to also add, you know, into this equation. Imagine you're trying to get the sauce bottle, and somebody calls you on the phone. Imagine you've got a another huge list. Imagine that you're walking in there, and that you're tired, and you're at the end of a work day. Um, all the things that can impact. And we'll come back to the source bottle after we've explored the dirty dozen, but because I'm going to want you to just have a think about what they mean to you. What is really important as well about the dirty dozen is that this concept was developed not just to highlight what leads to human error, because whilst it's important that we start to understand that, the most important thing and the reason for developing this concept was to enable us to develop strategies to counteract um, these components. So what we're going to do today is we're going to break them down. We're actually going to go through the dirty dozen and we're going to consider um, examples in healthcare. I'm going to come up with some examples today, but then from today, what I want you to be able to do is to go back to your own workplace, Think about how it would work in your environment. Think of your own examples. Get your team to think of their own examples. And then you can come up with the strategies that would help you and your colleagues um, in that space. So we're going to work through them and we're going to work through them um, three at a time. Um, the first one, always going to be top, is lack of communication. And it's often at the top of contributing factors um, in any incident. Now, when we think about communication, we've got to think about the person who is transmitting that information as well as the person that is receiving information. We've got to think about, you know, lack of communication is about just not really being heard, the message not being across or communication that is actually misleading. Um, one of the things that we're often um, very um, you know, capable of doing is actually leading people into decisions with our communication. And I'm sure you can all think of examples where you've done this yourself. Um, and one of those situations would be um, maybe if you say to a colleague, I'll give you some examples, this result is normal, isn't it? Now, if I ask um, Zeb and I ask um, my colleague Zeb, this looks normal, doesn't it? he's much more likely to say to me or to think, okay, Maria thinks it's right. So already I'm influencing his decision. Um, we have to think about that differently. And I have to ask Zeb, can you please interpret this result for me? Or can you, you tell me your interpretation of this result? So I don't put in any bias into that. I don't lead him into that. It's really important that we think about and reflect on how we speak to people in that way. 
and how that message may come across. Now, we may think we're being really helpful to, you know, if I'm telling Zeb that it looks normal, just tell me that it's normal. But that's not um, that's not opening up that channel effectively. So we need to just as a strategy to start thinking and start reflecting ourselves and as a team. We also have our structured tools to use when we're communicating. So things like using the ISBAR, using um, you know any of those tools that you do. We need to think about breaking down barriers so that we're comfortable communicating with our colleagues and that we're able to say um, openly what we're thinking. And another tool that we can use is our closed loop communication. And um, I heard um, a colleague of mine um, talking about this and fascinated really why in healthcare we're in some ways we've not really adopted this um, as well as people for you know, example, in um, other industries. So if you go today um, on your way home for, from work and you pick up a takeaway for your team, I can more or less guarantee that there'll be closed loop communication. If you call in at Macca's for the kids on the way home and you order your burger and chips, they will tell you that you've ordered a burger and chips. So they're really good at it and we could do better. They're just things to think about. People will think that it's um, unnecessary but it's that second um, check-in to make sure that we're heard correctly. Complacency um, is another one. And the people that use these tools in aviation um, have said to me that when I, somebody told me that they used to use this tool at the beginning of, so they'd have a handover of what was happening today and they'd go through the dirty dozen and people would speak up and say um, which ones they thought were likely. If nobody could think of one, they'd always use complacency because if we're becoming complacent and don't think anything um, is going wrong, then you can absolutely put that one to the top of your list. So what we mean by complacency is that feeling of self-satisfaction that's accompanied by a loss of awareness of possible dangers. So we just become immune to that. And usually that happens when things seem so simple. So a task can just seem so simple that we just assume that it will always go right and it's never gone wrong before and so why should it you know now it's always been okay we've never had any problems if you ever hear yourself um, talking like this to yourself inside or openly with your colleagues then you need to start to think outside the box and challenge assumptions just because we've always done some things you know things in that same way doesn't mean it's still right today there's new knowledge all the time and we need to check that out and, you know, we need to check in not only with ourselves, but with our teams and we need to challenge those assumptions. Complacency can, you know, really lead as well to confirmation bias. We really um, and we risk that diagnostic error because we've just become complacent. We need to review all our patients individually and we need to look for those other different, you know, those other diagnoses. So other things that we're looking for. So just check in with each other and think about that one. The lack of knowledge. So new things are out all the time. Every day things change, especially in this world um, that we're in now with our pandemic of COVID. We're learning new things about that. There's new information every single day. It's a challenge to keep up with it. Um, and, you know, so it's really important that we have a culture in which we can speak up and that we encourage our colleagues to speak up. We role model this and we're all aware that it is OK and that we should say if we don't know something. A lack of knowledge also includes that lack of experience or on the job knowledge. So it's just that, you know, we need to just share that information and share it widely. So we need to then and create opportunities to learn from each other. Effective handovers. It may also be that we've got a lack of knowledge because we didn't listen to the patient or we didn't hear what they were saying. We heard what we thought they were saying. So again, it's about checking in with that concept. Distraction, a big one all the time. So if we're distracted, that leads to our loss of situational awareness. We just lose sight of everything that's happening around us. When we have competing tasks, they can really push us over our threshold of our working memory and we get that cognitive overload. So we just can't do it. Multitasking is actually a myth. 
So if you're thinking that, um, you know, you, you're good or not so good, when you're multitasking, you're actually just getting your brain to just keep flipping between different bits of information. You can't possibly think of two things, have two things in your mind at the same time. That doesn't happen. So when we're distracted from a task, when we return, our brain's automatically having to go back one or two steps. So it's good to be aware of that and just to be aware of that um, that thought. We always need to try and avoid interrupting those safety critical tasks. Create circles of safety around each other so that, you know, if we know one of our colleagues is in that process, then try not to interrupt them during those times. And if we are interrupted during a safety critical task, then remember that we're going to need to go three steps back and just make sure that we're back where we were. Um, we can use checklists as well, stop the clock moments and asking everyone, you know, is OK. All things that can help us with our distraction. Remember as well that worrying about other things distracts us. COVID's been a key example. So wearing PPA for people has been very distracting from the task. And we've heard lots of stories about that. So again, it's checking in with each other. And, you know, speaking up if you don't know something, if you're not sure if you've got the right PPA, that will distract you. So speak up and ask someone, ask for help. Home worries as well can distract us. We can't do anything about that. We take those with us sometimes and they will come in our mind. So, again, it's managing that and being aware of our colleagues who also could have that distraction. Takes us nicely into lack of teamwork because that is so important in here. And if there's a lack of teamwork, we can generally just feel unsure about what's happening. What's the plan? What's happening now? What are the strengths and weaknesses in our team? Do we always know those? It's really important that we don't make assumptions. Um, and, you know, don't make assumptions about people's capabilities or skills. And remember, if people are moved out of their usual work area, you know, all these sort of things contribute. Think of the human factors that are going to affect your team colleagues today and what have an influence. Key example in this could be, you know, you could be working with somebody highly experienced and then they move areas. They can feel like you must, you know, have all felt at times like a fish out of water because you're not in your normal environment. So we need to talk at our team handovers and think about that, working through problems together. And again, using our dirty dozen as a team to predict and plan strategies. Fatigue. So fatigue's that, you know, natural physiological reaction when we're exposed to prolonged physical or mental stress. That can have a real, you know, strong effect of us. And, you know, the stronger and the more the fatigue, it can actually make us have the same effects as being intoxicated. So it's really important to be aware of that. And we sometimes can't avoid that we're working when we're fatigued. But what we must remember is that that will affect our ability to make decisions and we can forget and we're more likely to get distracted and lose situational awareness. Fatigue also comes in for those, any of you that have ever worked a night shift, unless you're a total night owl between the hours of um, four and five, people will hit that real um, difficult, challenging time when we have that window of circadian low, the tired hours where you just feel really more vulnerable to that. Things that we can put in place, strategies. So we want to avoid those, you know, non-essential safety critical tasks when we're most fatigued, if we can. So we don't do um, operating lists overnight that don't need to happen. But at the same time, we're not in a situation in healthcare where we can always walk away and say, OK, we're, we're too fatigued. What we need to do is we need to call for help. We need to work with our teams. We need to acknowledge that and we need to seek second opinions, um, talk through your decisions and particularly when we're fatigued and encourage our colleagues to talk through their decisions with us. Um, it's really important and taking breaks, supporting our colleagues to take breaks. Sometimes when we're busy, we can just forget to take breaks and don't take those opportunities. Completely acknowledging that sometimes it's not possible, but when we can have the opportunity, it's going to make us much more effective. It's going to improve our decision making. So when we feel like that and our battery's really low, take the time to take a break. Remember when you next see this sign, you know, we think about that on the road. Stop, 
revive, survive. It's the same principles in, um, in our working lives as well. We need to think about it. And when we get that opportunity to stop, we need to revive and su to survive. Lack of resources. So just not have, can be as simple as not having the equipment that you need, not having the stuff that you need. Can be that you're searching for things in an emergency. Um, or it could be that you're then, you know, so then what you start to do is make do and you do work around. So we start using things that aren't appropriate. Remember me using the gray bags and what sort of trouble that can get you into. So it's really important if you don't have the resources to speak up and escalate um, and encourage your teams to speak up and escalate, having respect for our resources that we do have um, so that we maximize those and discussing these sort of issues at our huddles. We shouldn't make do or assume that people around us know many situations that you will hear where people think, oh, I'm sure that my manager knows. You know, don't make that assumption. They may not know. They may not know that you're doing workarounds or again, it may have just slipped them. They're human too. So we need to speak up there. Those pressure feelings, feelings of being overwhelmed. Um, and this will really um, affect how we function. And new situations can make us also feel under pressure. And a particular story that I heard that related to pressure was um, a nurse who works in the UK, Claire Cox. She told her story really clearly on a podcast and um, relating to her experience in COVID. And Claire is a highly experienced um, intensive care unit nurse who worked on an outreach team, had attended many, many, many emergencies. And she literally found herself feeling with the changes and all the requirements around PPE, feeling just frozen on the spot outside a room. So never assume that people, because um, of their level of experience, that they won't hit pressure spots. It will happen to all of us. So be aware of that. Check in with each other. Speak up if you feel pressured yourself and take stop the clock moments. And during those stop the clock moments, think about, you know, how can you prioritize and think about asking for help. Our lack of assertiveness. So often we will notice significant issues. Sometimes it's not that easy to do anything about this. Sometimes it's much easier than other situations. We can often feel that the way things are done now are not exactly the right way, but we're just not able to say, we've just not found that right situation. We may think that something's significantly wrong, but we still can't, um, we're just not, able to feel like we can speak up. This is really um, important to really practice our assertiveness techniques. And there's some great resources on the CC web, and I'm sure Zeb will put things up in the chat. Um, you know, working out, um, looking on, you know, how can we speak up for safety? How can we improve that in our teams? How can we look at our work culture? How easy is it to speak up in our teams? Um, have a look at our resources on there because so important and if you've ever got a gut instinct then really believe that we need to respond to our gut instincts because most often when we review an error or something later somebody in the team will have felt that something wasn't right and just probably didn't speak up stress subconscious response to pressure there many things will contribute to stress you know stress can be things that we bring with us to work we can't always leave our stressors um, as we work in. What we've got to do is work out how we can manage those in our working day. But stress will reduce our energy and our concentration, and it makes our decision making more difficult. So you can see how all of these interact. So if we're under pressure, we're going to be more stressed. If we're fatigued, we're going to also be more stressed. If we can't um, assert ourselves, we're going to be more stressed. There's also the stress we come across when we get that acute stress on top of that we're in an emergency situation. It's a natural response. We need to be aware how that can affect, again, our decision making. And we need to have those strategies. This is where, you know, the things like our checklists and briefings and things like that all really come in their own. Taking um, stop the clock moments, um, calling for that help, giving help, being aware of our own levels um, of self-care, and again, the CC have some great resources on self-care that you can look at and share um, with your teams. The lack of awareness. Um, so often that can be because we're just working in isolation and you know that can be contributed with um, 
um, you know, not working as a team and working in isolation, that can really lead to a bit more tunnel vision and it can just stop us from seeing the whole picture. We can also have that lack of awareness because we just lose sight and get distracted and we just can't see it. Often when we look at errors um, and review things, people will say, we just didn't see, we didn't notice at the time, um, and we just lost sight of the whole picture. So again, it's really important to think about those strategies. How can we improve and maintain our awareness of the full picture? How can we maintain that situational awareness? Remembering as well that it's okay not to know, um, and it's okay to to feel that you know we're in these situations where all these things are coming into play. It's not something that's a weakness. It's good to you know we need to speak up, and we need to be kind in our response um, to people if we're really to improve all these aspects. And the very final one of our dirty dozen is about norms. And norms are just when we work to that set of unwritten rules or beliefs, they can really detract from our safety. And if you've ever heard yourself saying in your mind, well, we do that because that's the way we do things around here, or that's the way we've always done things and it works well for us, um, or we don't do it in that way because our patients are different. It's not the way we do things. Check out where, you know, check in with yourself there and just check in with your team um, because you know, this can really detract from safety. Um, and it's really important to check. You can pick up on norms and things like that through audits, you know, just looking for workarounds, looking for what we're doing, just because we've always done it in that way. Refer to our policies and guidelines. And if they're not working for us, or we don't think that they're fit for the purpose, then we need to raise concerns with those so that we're not just working around the situation. We need to put analytical thinking into place if we're to really challenge what has become just the normal way of doing things around here. So we come to the end of our dirty dozen and just again to reiterate, we need to be able to start to be aware and notice the dirty dozen, notice and think about, you know, what which of those may impact on our day or which are the are already impacting on our day which already exist and understand how they might impact on our day and then we can work with our teams and think and plan ahead so in the chat box now what i want you to do is to start to tell me tell me which of the dirty dozen may affect you and may make you make an incorrect selection of a tomato sauce bottle. So, you know, if you think about me and I've got a call for this tomato sauce on the way home from work, it must be Coles um, own make. It must be the full fat, full sugar version. Um, on the way in, I've also got to remember to get carrots, potatoes, bread, eggs, yogurts. My phone rings. I need to get some wash powder as well. The wash powder has got to be the um, bold variety. Um, I also... Um, need to hurry up and get on because we're on I'm on the clock and I've got to get back um tea's due in at six so any any dirty dozen going to affect me here Zeb do we have any takers on the dirty dozen anybody seeing any of those that yeah, are going to getting, affect me we're getting quite a few distraction that's big yep definitely pressure. yep under Fatigue. pressure yep complacency yep stress yep Okay, so lack of awareness. Lack of awareness. Okay, I might just, yep, just losing sight of what I need, what's the job in hand, and what I need to do. And you know, can be complacent, just thinking, of course, I'm just going to pick up. How hard can it be? I'm just, you know, it doesn't matter. Remember as well, what's really important. It doesn't matter if I take the wrong bottle of tomato sauce home, um, especially these days. But if we're picking something else incorrect off the shelf then that's going to have a much more significant. Remember, you know, we can have our patient with a threat of the penicillin allergy. We've got to make sure that we're picking the right things off the shelf, that we're making correct selections, that we're making um, that, you know, we're writing up a correct prescription, for example. So the consequences of our actions can be very different um, in different situations. 
So think about, you know, which of the dirty dozen affected me in my um, lunch trip, in my lunch preparation. Um, any different ones there or are they pretty much the same? If you can pop some in the chat, that would be really good. So I can just see which ones you think. This will help me to think about and I'm really hoping to never forget my lunch again. So if you can give me some top tips on which of the dirty dozen were affecting me. I think my biggest one was um, distraction um, and pressure to get to work um, and the stress of that. Um, not sure if there were any others. What's really important is that um, you have to think about the strategies that you're going to put in place to make sure that that doesn't happen again. So I don't know what came in the chat, but I'm just going to also put another thought in your brain. And Zeb's going to put up a, a poll in because I want you to tell me what you think. We've got a question going in the in the poll now. So I come along. This is a, an image of me. Can you sign my CTG, please? Um, it's all normal, isn't it? Is this the way I should be asking my questions? Yes or no? just an example of how you know you can develop your own tools develop your own ways of how you're going to incorporate dirty dozen elements and strategies how you could do it in your workplace so coming up with templates and tools this is um, how it's been um, implemented in some um, education in some of the mandatory education i'm going to leave you with one last thought when you put your dirty dozen elements and consider um, what's going to implement always think about the strategies that you put in place. So this was a tree in my garden a few years ago. And what I'm going to tell you about is that tree. Every time I'd walk up and down the garden, there used to be a branch that came out of that tree. And every single time I went out to mow the, the garden, I would bang my head on the tree. I'd just walk into that branch. Now, that was really painful, and I didn't want to do that. And every time I would remember that when I came out and my husband had shouted out, don't bang your head on that tree again. And I would tell myself, um, don't bang, you know, I'm really not going to do this today. But what would happen is I'd start up the mower and I'd get going. And maybe the first time I'm not bang my head on the tree and I come back down and then I'm concentrating on doing my lines and bang, bang my head on the tree again. So it doesn't matter how many times um, you do something. Um, you know, or tell yourself or how painful the experience is, it doesn't say that you won't take that risk away. So the only thing that I had to do is I tried to put these stretches in place. I just had to chop the branch down. That was the only way that we could take it away. So you've got to relook. You've got to test out your solutions and have a think about what's going to work in your strategies. They may not always work. So have a think about what's going to work for your team. It may not be as drastic as chopping down the tree. I could have put a fence around the tree, um, but you know that, that wasn't as optimum for me. But you can have a think about what you can put in place. So lead, leaving that with you, think about you know, what can you implement, start testing out. Remember that it's really you know, the best idea. Use those principles of quality improvement methodology. So think about your ideas and get testing. Plan them and test small and keep testing until you start to see, you know, results start to see um, what's going to help. Your own safety starts with you. So, you know, check in with yourself, check in which of the dirty dozen may affect you. And then also what's going to affect those people around you. So and speak up for the health worker safety. So we're going to move into question time. And I don't know if anybody's got any comments. Um, thank you so much for joining us on our webinar today. I hope that's given you some um, useful strategies and some thoughts, but um, we'll open up. And if there are any questions, then very happy to, um, to take those. Hi, Maria. It's Kath Ryan. Hi, Kath. How are you? Good, good. I'm just. Uh, I just want to say we. Um, I had another meeting earlier this morning. Um, we were talking about something completely different, but we were actually able to apply, or I was able to apply 
several aspects of the dirty dozen to the situations where the communication within the teams from different departments was quite poor. Um, everybody was on a different page. Um, there was a lot of, well, I assumed you'd do this. Well, I thought you would have to do that sort of type thing. So be able to actually identifying what was happening in the conversations and, and applying the um, dirty dozen to that conversation. Everyone sort of went, oh, yeah. That's not such a good thing, is it? So, you know, we apply it in so many different areas. It's great. Thank you for that, Kath. That's great to hear.